This video is brought to you by Squarespace. When it comes to websites, online stores, etc., there's no place to build a beautiful online presence like Squarespace. Happy holidays. Welcome to Carson's top 20 movies of the year video. I saw more movies this year than I have in a long time because it was a good ass year, no? Yet there are still some that I did not get a chance to see before this video. If I'm being honest, the one movie that has an honest to God shot at making the top 20 that I didn't see was Babylon. So once I see it, if it does happen to make the cut, I'll update the list in the comments below. I promise. But please understand that I want to get these out before the end of the year and that I have contractual deadlines that I gotta hit and we all gotta live with that, okay? Anyway, I know I say this every year, but what a fantastic year for film. It's so good I considered doing a top 30. I know, crazy. But we're gonna keep it to top 20 and get on with some honorable mentions, which include The Batman, Elvis, Glass Onion, Flea, and Crimes of the Future. Now that that's over with, let's get into the proper list. At number 20 is Pleasure, directed by Ninja Thyberg. At number 19, it's Broker, directed by Corieta. Number 18 is Women Talking, directed by Sarah Polly. At number 17 is Barbarian, directed by Zach Kreger. At number 16 is Everything Everywhere All at Once, directed by Daniels. And at number 15 is Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, directed by Dean Fleischer Camp. At number 14 is Funny Pages, directed by Owen Klein, a hilarious and strange movie about a teenage cartoonist that made me laugh harder than anything else I saw this year. At number 13 is Great Freedom, directed by Sebastian Meist, a painfully underrated movie about a gay man living in post-war Germany who is imprisoned under paragraph 175. It's seriously one of the best shot and action movies I saw this year. I can't believe more people aren't talking about it. At number 12 is The Northman, directed by Robert Eggers, a movie that puts some hair on my chest and is one of the grittiest of the year. And finally, at number 11 is Triangle of Sadness, directed by Ruben Usland, a movie that is so close to the top 10 that I can taste it, a movie that gets away with being ridiculously unsubtle in its critique on the wealthy by being just an absolute blast from start to finish. Easily Usland's best, in my opinion. Give it up for these fellas. All right, on to the big boys. Luca Guadagnino's Bones and All might just be his best movie to me. It mixes my favorite elements from both Suspiria and Call Me By Your Name to create a cannibal romance road trip movie that's set in the 1980s Midwest. I cannot think of something more up my alley. It is certainly the only young romance that involves horror elements that properly skeeves me out whilst never losing focus of the romantic core of the film, a balance I did not know could be pulled off this seamlessly. Timmy had to make his way into this list somehow, and I'm glad he did. All the Beauty and the Bloodshed is a documentary about the life of legendary photographer Nan Golden, highlighting her upbringing and rise to fame, as well as her recent activist work going up against the Sackler family. While it may seem like two separate stories being told at the same time, the film makes the case for it being one, and linking America's past to the present in a way that shakes you to your core. Of the film's many achievements, I was particularly blown away by the case it makes for activism in current society. I feel like it's very easy to brush it off, as it feels like there's so much activism these days, but this film really really speaks to just how important it is. It speaks to the accessibility of it and the actual change that can be made. What I'm saying does not do this film justice. I don't know how I could because the way this so gracefully ties in American history to the urgency of what we're living through now in a way that grips you almost immediately, it's indescribable. There are a few documentaries I've seen that have been edited this well and whose messages felt this dire and who got those messages across so passionately. It's a gripping movie that I cannot recommend enough if you're going to give any film on this list a chance, make it this one. If you told me this time last year that the new Top Gun movie would be on my top 10 in 2022, I would say good for them. Top Gun Maverick ignited a fire under my ass all three times I saw it. The absolute commitment to the craft immerses you immediately in its electric opening credits and you don't tap out until the end. It feels like it comes from another time, which it sort of does before movies felt the need to tell you you're watching a movie, before all the self-awareness and annoying tropes that come with contemporary cinema. All while directly referencing our attachment to relics from the past, the desperation to hold on to something that's slipping away from you uncontrollably, and telling it all in the cheesiest, most energizing way possible. Tom Cruise delivers a performance that cements himself as maybe the greatest living movie star we have left, a performance that both knows its place as his kind ages out of the industry while simultaneously flexing how he is the best guy we have right now. Top Gun Maverick is an entertaining thrill ride, of course, but it's the film's heart that lies beneath it every step of the way, and the passion that bleeds through the filmmaking that makes it one of the most exciting things I saw this year. When you say the movies are back, you think about this one. The Fablemans could have very easily been a miss for me, as I've never fully loved a movie about movies like that. But knowing it's by the guy who got me into movies as a kid, 
I don't know how I ever doubted him. I could sit here and talk about how personal this movie felt, how my dreams of becoming a filmmaker have never felt this accurately depicted before, but I think The Fableman succeeds because at the core of it isn't just this surface level love for the magic of the movies, but instead a person constantly being thrown around in life and how these changes inform the art. It understands the urgency and necessity for creating art, the need to feel in control to make sense of what's happening around you. The thing about The Fablemans is that even if I didn't know who Spielberg was, and even if I didn't really have a deep love for both film and the filmmaking process, this movie would likely still hit it out of the park for me. Because like I've said, at the core is a deeply human story about broken relationships that we can't escape from and how we cope properly. And it makes one of the most compelling cases for art being the thing that gets us through it all. I loved this movie. The Banshees of Inisherin is that one movie on the list that is just too perfect to fail. It's difficult to think of any shortcomings this movie has because there aren't any. It does what some of my favorite movies of all time do, it takes a rich, complicated feeling that involves breakups, legacy, war, and grief, and boils it into a tight, hilarious, and quaint story that anyone can relate to. It is charmingly niche, yet incredibly universal, which all comes down to McDonough's deceptively simple script, but can also be owed to the powerhouse performances by Colin Farrell, Brennan Gleeson, Carrie Condon, and Barry Keoghan. Damn it, even the donkey did a good job. It is one of the funniest and most human movies movies of the year, it's the easiest one on this list to recommend to people, and because of that, it will stand the test of time more than any of McDonough's previous efforts. It is the dictionary definition of doing a lot with very little. Maybe the most controversial pick on the list, I'll admit, but there was never a doubt in my mind that this would be here. We're All Going to the World's Fair might not be the most accessible or thrilling movie on this list. It's very slow, very quiet, and deals with pretty niche subject matter, internet creepypastas. But as someone who grew up using the internet, experiencing these same late nights going down rabbit holes, this captured that exact online experience better than any movie I've ever seen. And you guys know how long I've yearned for a good internet movie that captured that experience and World's Fair is the one. What this movie understands that most of its kind don't is the whole dual identity aspect of using the internet and the way we lose ourselves to these virtual environments. It recognizes the repercussions using the internet has on our actions in the physical world, why younger people would feel drawn to a separate existence online, what this does to younger people, and the loneliness. Oh my god, the loneliness. Even subtler details, like using Alex G's music as the main soundtrack for the film, someone whose sound is primarily born from the internet. In my opinion, it is one of the most urgent movies of the year that speaks to the current generation in a really dark and honest way, in a way that I haven't seen done before and in a way that felt incredibly refreshing. Speaking of movies that speak to the current moment, Tar is... <laughs> <laughs> Tar is such a strange, unique, hilarious, and unsettling movie. It's one of those where I'm like, is it really smart or is it just making fun of me? Todd Field plays with the viewer's perception of Tar with such subtlety that it comes across like a completely different movie the second time around, and I wouldn't be surprised if it came across like a different one the third time. Blanchett's performance of Lydia Tar accomplishes the same thing, treating interviews and every conversation with anyone as a performance where you don't really know where the real person is is the entire movie. The film is aggressively modern with its depiction of ego and how the characters' politics seep into their actions. Though the story involves cancel culture, for lack of a better term, it definitely doesn't feel like a cancel culture movie, because that would be boring and it would be cheesy, but Tar chooses to use that aspect of society to tell a story of a narcissistic artist with an obsession with power, and what happens when that power is stripped away, which has thus sparked some seriously insufferable discourse all over the internet on certain scenes, but proves the film's nuanced approach is ultimately pretty effective. I think it's a really funny movie too, and pokes fun at types of people that desperately needed to be poked fun at. It's a good movie. I love it. I, I, it's a tough one to talk about though. It's been a while since I've seen a good, original, larger-than-life blockbuster. We got some amazing, old-school Hollywood blockbusters this year, sure. I mean, just look at Top Gun. But if we're talking about movies that feel like they pushed the envelope and were thinking forward with their ideas and showing us things that we've literally never seen before, 
Nope is the prime example of that. Peel seems to be one of the few filmmakers out there who has the skill to get really weird with a big budget, and Nope is maybe the best example of that in his filmography. I get creeped out the more I think about Nope, the UFO scenes, the monkey stuff, just the idea of being in the middle of this desert with nobody to believe what you're seeing. For how many ideas and pieces this movie throws at you, it never feels bloated or overwhelming for a second. Peel delicately unravels the strange story without losing focus of the viewer, but he doesn't spoon feed anything to you either. It's my favorite kind of puzzle movie, if you want to call it that, because even when you do put together certain pieces, it doesn't mean you're done playing with it, per se. It just opens the door to more analysis, to different ways of looking at the movie, to looking at the world around you, and makes each rewatch just that much creepier. Honestly, it also just feels really good to see a horror movie this original and creative that doesn't feel random with its choices, that simultaneously respects its audience's engagement, but doesn't treat them like babies. Both Kiki Palmer and Daniel Kaluuya deliver some of my favorite performances of the year. It is such a shame nobody is giving them the recognition they deserve. The cinematography is breathtaking, and it was such a treat to be able to see this in IMAX. We need more movies like this, but at the same time, it's Nope's one-of-a-kind feeling that made it such an unforgettable experience in one of my favorite movies of the year. I feel like I've talked about Decision to Leave a lot this year. I did a whole analysis for Pete's sake. And that's because there's a lot to say about Decision to Leave. It's one of the densest movies of the year, which to some may be an issue. I, I can see someone calling it bloated. To me, I can't get enough of that. Not only is it incredibly entertaining and cut in such a way that you never get bored for a second, you can't take your eyes off this thing, but it manages to tackle so many themes within its runtime, and it does so in a rich, cinematic way. Park Chan-wook's direction is so playful and witty, yet it never feels random. Every choice made here feels like a statement for cinema being the only way to convey certain feelings. It's one of those movies where it's directed in a way where I'm like, why is no one else directing stuff like this? It's the most romantic movie of the year, and just in general, one of the most romantic movies I've ever seen. It's a brutally honest and realistic movie about love, and it's the film's brutal honesty that makes it so romantic. Great films should make you look at a part of your own life in a different way, not critique them or validate you necessarily but to put things in a different perspective. And the ways Decision to Leave talks about love is something I will hold on to and think about for the rest of my life. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. This was a great year for film, right? It felt like the first time in a long time that we got some massive, ambitious films that used the weight of their form to tell original stories, which is why it feels strange to cap off what has been such an extreme year with the quaint and quiet masterpiece that is Charlotte Wells' Aftersun. But this little movie, this, this little guy right here, it broke me, and it reminded me what the purpose of film is, which is a crazy statement to slap onto a movie, but this thing is so good that that's not even the only reason it's number one one for me. After Sun shouldn't work as well as it does, as it doesn't feel like much is really happening for most of the movie, being that it's told primarily through memories. The story is loose, the characters both have shells around them that feel incredibly difficult to break down. But once they do break these shells, and you start to live in these memories with Sophie, it just gets sad. There's this feeling that something bad is lurking beneath everything, and the film somehow, I do not know how, made me feel that same feeling I felt as a kid, when things felt bad and I couldn't understand why. It's a powerful feeling that still creeps up every now and then, and this movie nailed it. As a performance revolving around depression and insecurities, Paul Meskel hit it well out of the park. He delivers easily the best performance of the year. It, it feels beyond acting. <laughs> Frankie Corio complimenting him perfectly. There is something very familiar about watching After Sun, a feeling like I've been in this story before, which maybe I have. Maybe there are parts of my childhood like this that are just insanely repressed that I haven't been able to make sense of until now. I certainly do remember the feeling of seeing my parents and being like, oh, they they're not, they, they're messed up too. And it's a complicated feeling that, you know, you're not, you don't know if you're supposed to feel good about it or if it's supposed to make you feel worse. It's weird. Wherever this feeling came from, it was there. And this film brought it out of me and gave me a sense of catharsis in the end, which is the greatest thing I could ask for from a film and undeniably makes it the greatest piece of work I saw this year. 
this is what the movies are about. I'm gonna get out of here before I start crying about After Sun again. Those are the top 20 movies of the year. Thank you all for a great year. We did some numbers this year, and that, you know, that's thanks to you guys. I got fun plans for next year, and I can't wait for you all to listen to them. As always, thanks for watching. Go watch all these films and form your own opinion, and before you head out, I wanna thank this week's sponsor, Squarespace. Now, Squarespace, if you didn't already know, is a place where you can go online to build your brand, whether that be an online store, blog, portfolio, you name it. They have professional portfolio designs where you can create galleries for your work, as well as password protected pages for clients. Me personally, I'm a big fan of their video block feature, which allows me to showcase some of my favorite films and videos in a way that looks really nice. Plus they have a built-in mobile web designer where any website you make is gonna look great no matter what platform it's on while still matching your style. The best part about it all though is that if you go to squarespace.com slash Karsten, you can get 10% off of your first purchase. So why not give it a chance? It's, you know, you don't have a website yet, use Squarespace, build that website, get on it. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hey, thanks for a good year. And I'll see you on the next one.